بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول حق وهو يحكي سبيل أشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأصحابه ومن اتبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa taala we praise him with the most beautiful of praises and we bear witness that he is the only deity worthy of worship in truth alone without any partners and we bear witness that the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his last and final messenger um first of all i just want to say jazakallahu khair for everyone who came and took the time out of their busy schedule you could have been anywhere on a friday night but alhamdulillah rabbil alamin you chose to come and learn about a very important topic and a topic that is dear to myself which is da'wah now of course as we all know da'wah is a intrinsic if not integral part of Islam and it is something that is wajib upon every muslim to be able to know and to do and to carry out alhamdulillah rabbil alamin it is something that is for the line that it, every individual must be able to know the basics of the religion and to spread it to whoever they can whenever they can in a manner that is best pleasing to Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala and his rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam so i'll begin firstly by um asking you all a question um and i want you to understand that if your phone is out it is for taking notes because there is going to be an exam so please make sure that you take notes and that you are ready for an exam because this is a class of course and we cannot cover every topic that will arise in dawa but we will try to give you guys a good foundation so that bi nadaala when it comes time for you to actually give dawa you have somewhere to start from inshallah ta'ala so my first question is um what is islam anybody that feels they have an answer please raise your hand and inshallah we will yes brother what's your name hamza fadl uh, islam uh, is keep going is that it Just... okay alhamdulillah so the brother hamza he's explaining the lughatan the ta'rif al islam na the the root word that islam comes from in the arabi is aslama which means to submit islam is the masdar of that verb and it means the submission or what we when you put the ma'rifa on it and it becomes the islam na? so this is the religion and it means submission to the one creator can somebody give me another definition have if you will of what is islam this brother what's your name hakim hakim Allahu akbar what what is islam brother islam is uh, a way of life chosen by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no okay. okay so yes that is one of the yes no. So the brother very well like very beautifully explained that Islam is a total way of life. It's not just a religion. It is something that is all encompassing in its objectives and its application in our daily lives. So this is why Islam is super yani it is something that supersedes all other ways of life. There's nothing like Islam and there will never be anything like Islam. Can anybody give me one more definition of what is Islam? And I want you to think perhaps of a hadith that comes to mind. Of Jibril alayhi salam. The hadith? The hadith of Jibril alayhi salam where he was he asked the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a man Sorry. what is islam does anybody does this ring any bells for anybody? yes muhammad uh, 
Yeah, he approached uh, the prophet, the Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about this. He asked him to the guy the question, and he answered. And then, um, and then once he finished, he walked away. And then the prophet asked him, so he asked someone to call that man back over. But they said he disappeared, like there's no one there. And the prophet said that it was a real coming down uh, to teach people about Islam. Yeah, so what, what is Islam in that hadith? What did they say was Islam? You beautifully explained the, you know, all the back story and all, all of that. But what, what specifically in the hadith it mentions, he asked Prophet Wasallam, what is Islam? And the Prophet Wasallam replies, The one who believes in Allah and his messengers and his books, uh, the one who follows it's close, it's close, but it's more, it's more basic than this. It's very basic. Does anybody remember? No? Okay, I guess that's why you're here, right? <laughs> yes. This. So, Al-Islam an tashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Continue, brother. Naam. 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 No. So this is the definition that was given uh, in this hadith about what is Islam. Now I'll ask you guys a second question. What makes you a Muslim? Yes, brother, what's your name? Adir. 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 So what is uh, what makes you a Muslim, brother? Um, you practice Islam, you give like the teachings and stuff like that. And, uh, okay, that is true. I want to ask you something more specific, if you don't mind. If somebody is new to Islam and they're not practicing those aspects yet, are they not Muslim? No, they are. Okay, so then what makes them Muslim? Um, that they believe in Islam. Alhamdulillah. So what exactly do they need to believe in? Allah. Okay. And that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what you are describing is the shahada. So the shahada, does anybody know the shahada? Um, I don't want to pick anybody. So I will I will pick unless somebody puts their hand up. This brother here in the glasses, the American Eagle sweater. What's the shahada? What's the shahada? Like if somebody was going to become Muslim, and they have to say something to become Muslim, what do they say? So what does that mean though? It was very close, Jazakallah khair for um, you know, being brave and, and, and saying the question. But um, it is a bit more encompassing than that. So when we say Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, we are saying I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship in truth except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's very ill befitting to, to just translate it as there is no God but Allah. Because there is more that in, is in, entailing in that statement. Right? And when we say Ashadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah, we are also saying that I bear witness that there is that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is his last and final messenger. Right? Um, so this is the Shahada. So this is something that we should all know, obviously, and that um, is a key aspect in da'wah because what when I'm giving da'wah I want to see the person that I'm talking to and see where where do they lie are they somebody that believes in Allah are they something that somebody that doesn't believe in Allah are they somebody that believes in prophets or are they somebody that doesn't believe in prophets based off of the person I will tailor the da'wah to that person right and this is where we'll transition into um, the second thing that I wanted to mention is that there are usul in da'wah so there are things that we call the foundations of da'wah. And the ulama talked about how there are four usul in da'wah. One is mawdu'a da'wah. 
So the realm of Dawah or the pur the purpose or intent behind Dawah or the yani, the discussion about Dawah. Can anybody guess what this is? Modua Dawah. If somebody asks you what what are you calling to? What are you calling to? Tawheed? Tawheed. Yeah. So Islam, Tawheed, yes. If somebody and so now we go into the second usul, which is a da'i. What is a da'i? Calls towards Islam. The person that's calling towards Islam, yes. No. What about Madu'u? That which is being called. Who who are the people that are being called to Islam? The disbelievers, yes. And wasail. What is wasail? The means of da'wah. So we will focus on the yani I guess we will focus on the da'i. We will focus on what is the people that we are calling to, because I think these two things are the most important. There are other avenues of da'wah, of course, where you know there's brothers that give street da'wah. There is for the sisters. Sisters can give da'wah online. Sisters can give da'wah um, to other you know um, sisters and other uh, Muslim sisters. Brothers can be on the streets. Brothers can be everywhere because it's more befitting for them. But these are, and there's obviously, you know, TV programs, there's internet, podcasts, I mean, there's a lot of um, avenues now to give da'wah. But we will focus on um, the ones that I mentioned, of the da'i and the, uh, what is being, uh, the people that we are calling to. So, I wanted to start, and I wanted to give you guys a foundation of certain key aspects or key conversations, people that you would talk to. So... Amongst the non-Muslims in your locality, who do you think you come across the most that are from the people that you are trying to call to Islam? Co-workers. Co-workers? Okay. Anyone else? Neighbor. Neighbor? Okay. What about the types of people? What about, like, what religion do they identify with or what religion do they not identify with what do you think what's the people that you come across the most atheists atheists christians christians yeah and six six yeah who else jewish jewish yeah hindus hindus yeah hindus okay so I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a arsenal, so to speak, for each of these categories of people. So we'll start with the atheists. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, or were they created by nothing, or are they their own creator? So when the atheist comes to you, what do they tell you? Somebody tell me. Yes, but sorry. His brother put up his hand, so I have to. What's your name, brother? Muhammad. What do the atheists tell you? There's no God. Okay. So, do they say anything else to you? Life came from the Big Bang. Yeah. Uh, any other brother here? You, you, you wanted to say something. Too. Was it you? Majid, was it you? Oh, I just said that. Okay, okay. Yes, sir. We evolved from monkeys. We evolved from monkeys. Evolution. Evolution. Okay. Okay, so these. We don't need religion. We don't need religion, right? Okay. We are fine. We are fine on our own. Let's figure it out as we go. Okay. okay. So these are all true. These are, all true. These are statements that I've come across in um, my years of giving Dawah. And we'll try and you know, give you guys some concrete. Um, argument to say that one thing that I would say for the brother mentioned the Big Bang theory is that a it's still a theory, and it's not the only theory amongst the physicists that when they try to postulate how the universe came to be. But even if we accept that the Big Bang is the start of the universe, what started the Big Bang? So we. We'll, this is the question that I asked the atheists. Is what started the Big Bang? What 
what is that thing that initiated all of this creation? If you're saying that the Big Bang is that thing, what, what initiated the Big Bang? What's that first cause? And a lot of the time, they don't have an answer for that. So my question is, what makes you different in claiming that I have blind faith if you don't actually have any concrete evidence that you're asking me for, for your position, right? So that's one thing that I always start with. One thing that I go on from that with the atheist is, like Allah says in the Quran, did they create themselves? Did you create yourselves or were you created? Do you know of anything in this universe that wasn't created, that didn't have a maker for it? that didn't have a start. So that's the idea is that if you're saying that the universe is the only thing that didn't have a start and it just came from nothing, show us one thing that comes from nothing. And there's nothing that comes from nothing. Something has to come from something, right? That's the basics of logic. So that's one position that we take. If we want to go further with the atheist and we want to say, okay, can chaos create design? Is there any situation where chaos creates design? Like when you actually press them on it, okay, what, what is the, uh, how did the, the numerical value for the speed of light happen? How did that numerical value happen? Where if the, if the sun was shut off right now, it would take eight minutes for the earth to be dark. Not six, not seven, it would take eight minutes. Why is that? Why? Because the speed has a specific constant to its light speed, right? Who put that information in light? Did it randomly evolve? And if it randomly evolved, why is it not changing? Why is it constant? There's other constants as well, the gravitational constant. We have these that we use in our physics formulae to develop our uh, understanding of the universe and the cosmos, right? So. Where did it come from? Where did this design information come from? And the atheists say, we don't, well, I don't know, but I don't need to know. Well, that's where I say like, okay, it seems like you're not as curious as me then, because I need to know, or I want to know, or if I'm not, if I don't know now, I want to try and find out, All right? Um, if we go further and we were to look at, for example, uh, the DNA of a human being. The DNA of a human being, does anybody know the base pairs for the, DNA? Any biology? Maybe. Yes, but ACTG? Yes, I see CTGA, but yes, very good. So, this CTGA or ATCG is how you say it? Yeah. Different combinations create what? Everything we see, everything we are able to touch, right? Different types, different genotypes create different phenotypes. So, who put that information in those building blocks? To make the different geno to make the different phenotypes that we see. That's the question that I always pose to the atheists is if you're saying that it's random and there's nothing, there's no design behind it, why do different why is just the changing of letters in this sequence create monkeys, create cats, create dogs, create bushes, create trees? Why does that happen? If there's no design behind it. When I was in university, I was kind of like thinking that it's kind of like when you're a kid and you're playing with Legos and you have different types of Legos, like a one by two square or a two by two square or a four by six square, those different types of Legos you can use to create different buildings. But the same person can take those same Legos, that same set of Legos and create a different building. But it's still the same building blocks of Lego. So who put the design there? It's the one behind the, the building blocks that creates the different buildings, right? And that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us. But they need to make a case for how that is not, um, that how the designer, that there is no design when we clearly see design in things. And oftentimes we use um, the cell phone example. Does anybody know the cell phone example? Anybody else? Okay, so, if this phone had no markings on it, like there wasn't no Samsung, no iPhone, no Nokia, no whatever, and you just found this in a desert, just like this, let's say it still had charge, so you were able to see and turn it on and it had a time and it had all this, would you assume that there's a creator for it? 
even though there's no markings or no brand, would you assume that somebody made the phone? So that's the question that we pose to the atheists. Is you assume that the phone has a creator, even though there's no brand, no marking, you didn't see it be made, you assume that it was made, because that's how you know phones to be made. And you can see design, you can see function in the phone, but something that is more complex than the phone, like the universe, something that is more complex than the phone, like your body, you assume it has no creator? Ask them to explain how that makes sense in their logic. How does that make sense? Yes, brother. I have a question, brother. Okay. Uh, last week, uh, we had the same like, place that I was, I was, I was giving that to an Indian driver, and I thought that was the same question. Mm -hmm. And then he said, uh, basically, we have the manufacturers, you can see who made it, so go and see him. Mm -hmm. yeah. so but we can see design. That's the, that's the argument that we are making, is that we can see design that we have physics formulas that tell us how fast things move in space, how fast sound moves in space, how fast light moves in space, what happens when a moon, like moons don't just you know become moons, they get pulled by gravity and that's based on a gravitational constant. And if it's moving at too fast a speed, it won't come into the orbit of a planet, it has to be at a certain speed so that the gravitational pull can attract that moon. So how does that happen? if there's no designer, if there's no design, if there's no intelligence in that space. That's the argument we're coming from. We can see design, so we should assume that there is a intelligent designer. Same way you would see design in this phone, you assume that there's an intelligent designer of the phone. If you, the, the analogy is that you didn't see the phone be made. And if you saw the phone be made, that would just be further evidence for you that the phone was made but you didn't see the universe made, but you can see effects of the designer in the universe. You understand? Yeah. So that's another thing we use. Another thing we use is that, does anybody know the minimum gene concept? No? It has to be a minimum, a minimum a number of genes to make a cell. A cell. A functional yeah. cell. Yes. So, the argument is that if there had to be a minimum set of genes in a single cell organism to survive, who put that there? Because it can't evolve, one, it can't evolve, two, it has to be there from the beginning. So somebody had to place it there. So who put that there? So those are some ways that we reason with the atheist to say you have, and what we say to the atheist is that we believe that you have blind faith because when it really boils down to the atheist perspective, it seems like you have blind faith. You've been told something about the way that the universe has come to be and the way that the Big Bang Theory explains everything and that we evolved from um, monkeys, as the brother said. But when we really get down to it, evolution in the idea that uh, change happens over time based on environment, that's a fact. Everybody understands that. When Charles Darwin did his study on those finches in the Arpa uh, archipelago, uh, he saw that when the rain came down harder, the nuts grew larger and they had a harder shell. I think that's the way that it worked. And then so the beak of the bird became longer and bigger and it, so that it could peck the nuts and get food. But when it was dry, the uh, nuts were not able to have as hard of a shell, so the beak didn't have to be as hard and or as long. And it was able to evolve into a shorter, less strong beak, right? So the, nobody denies that. But what we're saying is, is there any evidence for change of kind? The, the type of change of kind in evolution that Charles Darwin said that there's limits in his theory, that he had no, uh, no uh, evidence for. There was no empirical evidence of change of kind. You know how they're telling you that, you know, the, the plasma in the ocean then became a fish, and then that fish became a lizard, and then that lizard became a monkey. Like, that's the idea that we're talking about, is where's the change of kind? One thing that um, I thought was compelling um, when I was learning about this is language. Does anybody um, know why language is significant? Or where I'm going with this? Can you think? No, 
brother with the long hair. Why is language important for humans? Yeah. What does Allah say in the Quran about um, Adam and the king? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Adam's the name, taught Adam alayhi salam the names of everything. Even the angels didn't know, but Adam alayhi salam was taught. Now what's important for you guys to take home is that there was a researcher in California by the name of Suzanne Rochebaum. She tried to replicate evolution in, in, in apes. She wanted to prove that evolution was true. So what they did is they took apes, they taught them sign language, then they taught another ape sign language, then they had those two apes have a baby. And when that baby came out, they had that baby who was predisposed to learn sign language, again learn sign language, and then again mate with another ape that was predisposed to learn sign language. And they did this over generation and generation. And then they put these predisposed apes in a human home. And the idea was, We've, we've mimicked the, the course of evolution where we have made the environment and the genes susceptible to be able to acquire sign language. Now let's make them acquire to, uh, able to acquire speech and human recognition of speech and language. When they did that, they put these apes in a home with a human, and then another ape, and then they had those apes mate as well. And they did this over generation and generation. And their hypothesis was that we would see changes in the larynx, because the larynx is where we produce speech from, and we would see changes in their ability to either use sign language, manipulate language, or you know, eventually you know, actually create, create new language. But what did they find in this study? They didn't find any confirming data that suggested that the apes were able to evolve physically with their larynx or with their actual manipulation of sign language or actual language. So this was a big hit to them because they had clear evidence that was to the contrary, that language was not able to evolve. And their position was, oh, well, actually, we can't mimic evolution that way. But the idea was that we, would sh we should see some level of change, right? In an experiment, that you would wanna see some level of change. But they, the apes, after those generations of being indoctrinated, they were no better at language acquisition than a two-year-old human being. So this is why um, linguists like Noam Chomsky, he put forward the proposition that language is innate to human beings, that human beings are the only species in the world that are able to use and manipulate language. And we are able to use that language to create abstract ideas and send them, send them out into this, the world that is not confined by time and space and, and locality. And this is something that is unique to human beings. Now, why is it important for you as Muslims to put forward this idea that language is innate to human beings? Because Allah tells you in the Quran, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Adam the names of everything. And when you study neuroscience, you actually learn that there are places in the brain that are dedicated to language production and language recognition. They're called Broca's and Wernicke's area. So Broca's and Wernicke's area are places in your brain from birth that are dedicated to you acquiring knowledge, uh, acquiring language and reproducing speech for language. And that is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Adam alayhi salam the names of everything and he changed his mind back then. Allah Akbar. So that's something that we pose to the atheists is that if it is possible for evolution to explain everything, why haven't the apes been able to speak like in the movies that they, you know, planted up the apes? Why, why hasn't that happened yet? Why haven't you been able to reproduce that yet? We're waiting for it. We would love to see it in our lifetime. Okay. So one, so we just finished with the atheists. Let's move on to the Hindus. Can anybody tell me how many gods do the Hindus believe in? Ten. Ten? I think 300 million or so. 300 million? Huh? Limitless. Limitless, right? Unlimited. Unlimited? Allah. That's the six, yeah. That's the six. 
It's very good. So they have they have a lot. I think uh, a Hindu told me three hundred, and I've read about it that they have three hundred. But I think because of, like the brother said that you can also be a god, that it makes uh, it makes it infinite. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran. ضرب الله مثل رجلا فيه شركاء متشاكسون ورجلا سلم لرجل هل يستويان هل يستويان مثلا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran Allah sets forth the parable of a slave owned by several quarrelsome masters and a slave owned by only one master are they equal in condition So that's the question that we pose to the Hindus when they say that God has 300 there's 300 gods so we are we bring the i always i make it easy for them i say if i had a company or a business and my business had five ceos they all had the power to do the same thing they all had the same ability but they had to cooperate with one another in order to get anything done are they equal in their absolute power than a business that has one CEO that has complete control over the company? What's your answer? No, right? Exactly. So that's, and that's a Quranic argument. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting this forward to the polytheists that are they equal? People who share in dominion, are they equal? And that's what we say to the Hindu is that we actually feel that when you are splitting Allah up into, you know, more than one, na'udhu billah, that you are doing a disservice to the glory, sanctity, and the ownership of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over his mulk, over his, over his sovereign, uh, over his dominion, over his creation, that you are doing a disservice to him because we believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all powerful. We believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all, you know, all encompassing. And if you are dividing like this, your God, then they're actually cooperating and they're no longer absolute in their strength and their power. Does that make sense? So that's how we deal with the Hindus and usually where we get with the Hindu response is, um, you know, ev that's fine. Like everything is fine. You believe that, we believe this. They don't really want to get into any arguments. So that's why, but the ones that are sincere. Yes, brother. I have a question. Yeah. In relation to that, yeah. Hindus were learning if you talk to them. Yeah. They will come with the argument that we are not worshipping the idol. The idol is just a focal point mm -hmm. to focus on the true God, mm -hmm. which is basically three budgets for them. Yeah. So how do we come to that? Yeah, so alhamdulillah, that's a good point. That the ones who are learned, they'll say that, like you said, that their idols are just to get close to the Creator. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers that in the Quran, that the mushrikeen of the... Uh, uh, in Mecca, they were doing the same thing. They were using the lat is an anud. Yeah, just to get just to get close to them, right? Yeah. If you want to go deep with them, and you really want to like get them stuck somewhere, you can say that in the Vedas and the Upanishads, which are, which are their higher level scriptures, the Vedas and the Upanishads are what they claim to be the exact words. The Bhagavad Gita and the other ones are lower. They say in the Vedas and the Upanishads, you have clear statements like Allah Ekihe, Natasa Fatima Asti, that of that God there is no image, no idol, no painting, no picture. So when we pose this to them and we say, Your highest scripture says that you can't worship idols, that there are clear statements. But in your lower scriptures, you've innovated and done bid'ah, and you've now taken idols as. Inter intermediaries to get to God wouldn't you rather follow the scripture that is closest or more higher or more um, what you call closer to the words of God than the lower scripture if you really want to push them on it and when we do that to them they usually don't have an answer and they'll run away but um, it's something to think about for them that if you make that claim that this is the case and you can go even farther with the Hindus and say if it is truly from God why did he reveal something like the caste system where you are born into a lower class and you have no choice in the matter that you are just someone that is unrighteous by birth and that you can't even the lower class the untouchables they can't even hear the recitation of the vedas or the abhinishads or any holy scripture 
they can't even hear it. That the punishment for that is to have, um, if they hear it, to have hot oil thrown on them. That that is revealed by God? That doesn't make sense. That sounds like God is racist. And that's where it comes from, racism, if you really think about it. So that's the, uh, that's the answer that we give to the Hindus. And usually when we go there to the caste system, they don't have an answer for that. So that's my uh, two cents on that. And the Kalgi of Thar also. Yeah, that's a, like, you could go into the, there's prophecies about a Kalki to come after. And there's many descriptions about how his mother's name will be translated to Amina. So much. And yeah, and his and his father's name will be translated to Abdullah, servant of God, and that, as we know, is the names of the parents of the Prophet Sallallahu You can go into that, but a lot of the time, they're not really they don't read the, they don't even read their own scriptures, so they won't even know. But I think that if you stick with the Quranic argument, it's usually it is enough for just making the claim that you're not really making sense here, right? Okay. <clears throat> Now we'll move on to the Christians. So what do the Christians believe? There's a brother back there in purple shirt. What's your name? Yahya. Yahya? Okay, go. Tell me what, what do the Christians believe, brother? Santa is real? Okay. What's your name? Anis. 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 Yes, Anis. go ahead. Anis. Okay, yes. So that that's actually closer to the truth. Just like a lot of faith for that. Yes, brother? They believe that Isaiah is the son of God. Yes, they do believe that as well. And that is how it's done back to the sense. Yes, good. And the Trinity as well, yes. Yes, brother, again? That's a good point, yeah. So, so the whole Christmas thing is based on a lie. Yes, okay, good. So uh, these are all good points. So let's deal with one at a time. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, قُلْ هُوَ أَحَدْ Allah سَمِدْ لَمْ يِرِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يُكُلُّ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says clearly in the Quran that in the surah we all know that Allah is one, He's absolute and eternal. He does not beget nor is He begotten and there is nothing comparable unto Him. This is a, I mean, I think that this is something that we use to differentiate if it's a true God or not. So the second we know that Isa a.s. was born, that negates him from being a God. Because he has a birthday, he has a starting point. Allah does not have a starting point. Second we say that Isa a.s. is God himself, then we ask the Christians, why does your Bible say in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verse 32, that of that hour knoweth no man, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So if God is all-knowing, that we all agree God is all-knowing, right? God's all-knowing, why does Jesus not know the Day of Judgment? If He's one part of the Trinity, He should also know the Day of Judgment, but He doesn't know. If we go further and we say, in John 17, 3, Jesus is apparently said that this is eternal life, that they may know you, the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Can there be more than one only? No, right? So if that's the case, if there's only one only true God, and Jesus says that that's the Father, and that Jesus was sent by that one true God, then that's the Islamic belief. That Isa a.s. is a prophet sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he does not have all knowledge. He was given just a little bit. He knows some signs of the day of judgment like do all anbiya, but he was not given the day of the, of the day of judgment. And neither was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Right? So this is something that we say to the Christians. And if you really want to go into it with the Christians, you can use their Bible and show them that there are many mistakes and contradictions in the Bible. Um, I don't recommend you do that because, again, um, it can get you into a space where maybe you're out of your depth. But one thing that you can always ask them is, is the Bible preserved? 
if you don't have the original language of Isa salam in manuscript form. What language is the Qur'an in? And do we have the Qur'an memorized and documented in Arabic in the time of Muhammad Yes. Okay, so we have that claim that the Qur'an has been preserved and we have an isnad, a chain of narrators that goes back to the Prophet and we have manuscripts that are from that time carbon dated like the Sana'a Qur'an for example. But we don't have any manuscript of the words of Isa salam in Aramaic and that's his language that he spoke at that time. But they will come with all of these different arguments saying, oh yeah, Jesus spoke Greek too. So I don't know what scholar they will use to quote this, but I've heard this before uh, in my comment section that Jesus spoke Greek too because it was a common language like English is today. I just want one Christian scholar that says Jesus spoke Greek. If you could please bring forward that and then we can talk to him and ask him what's his source that Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, a Middle Eastern man, you know, born in Quds, why would he, born in the area of Quds, why would he know Greek? And why is he speaking Greek? And did, this, did his companions speak Greek? Like, is this uh, something that was uh, common knowledge back then, that they were multilingual and learned like that? Allah um, So that's how we deal with the Christians. Um, does anybody have any questions about that specifically? Because I know that sometimes that is a, a specific thing. No? no? Okay. Um, one topic that I thought you guys would benefit from is LGBTQ uh, philosophies and doctrine and how do we deal with that as Muslims and giving da'wah to people from those backgrounds. Um, does anybody have any experience dealing with people from that community? The, the gays and the... And, no? You guys are in school, right? I thought you guys were like... I, I, I work at a school sometimes. I see rainbow flags in the classroom. You guys don't? Yeah? Okay. So one thing um, I'll put forward is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being, He created Adam and Hawa. Now, if something is natural, it should be able to be scalable to the whole society and there be no detriment to the society. Does everybody agree that that's a good definition for natural? Yeah? So let me ask you guys something. What would happen if there was an island and on the island you had one man and a hundred women? What would happen to that island? Would it be dead? Would it die? Would it be extinct? Or would it be a thriving community after a hundred years? Thriving community. Thriving community? Yeah. Okay. What would happen if there was an island and there was only men on that island? They would die. They would die. What if, what would, what if the opposite was true? What if there was an island and there was only women on that island? They would die. What if there was an island and there was one man and trans women on that island? Biological males that transition into becoming female. What would happen to that island? It died. It died. What if the opposite? There was one woman and biolog and trans trans uh, trans men on that island. What would happen to that island? Died. Okay, good, good. So we can see clearly that it's not scalable to the whole society. Now, in science, you learn about an example that kind of demonstrates this and what's going on in our society today. And I've used this, and when I'm talking to people that support LGBTQ. I ask them if they've heard about this example and whether they think it relates to our society today. There is the puffer fish. Does anybody know the puffer fish? Yeah? So in the animal kingdom, in the ocean, there's a puffer fish. And this puffer fish, the way that it mates and the way that it gets its genes passed on to the next generation, its mode of reproduction, is that the male puffer fish will create a nest. And when it creates a nest, a female puffer fish will see a nice nest and she'll lay her eggs in that nest. And when she lays her eggs in that nest, the puffer fish that's waiting in the coral that sees the female puffer fish lay her eggs, he'll then come 
back to his nest that he made and he will uh, fertilize those eggs. And that's how his genes get passed on to the next generation. And that's how the female pufferfish's genes get passed on to the next generation. She hopes that somebody that's a pufferfish actually made that nest. And he hopes that somebody, uh, a woman, a female pufferfish will come to his nest after he's uh, created a good nest, right? Now the issue is, is that there is something called the rare frequency hypothesis where people can, or in, within a species, the main method of reproduction can be cheated. So in the puffer fish, what happens sometimes is that a male puffer fish will create a nest, a female puffer fish will come by and she will lay her eggs in that fish, uh, in that nest. Then some puffer fish that doesn't actually, didn't actually make the nest, didn't actually take the time to you know, work hard to make the nest, he'll come and fertilize the eggs and steal essentially those eggs and fertilize those eggs and get his genes passed on to the next generation without any effort or work. And then the fish, uh, the pup, male puffer fish that made the nest comes back, finds his eggs being fertilized and he raises them anyways. So he's like, okay, they're here now anyways. So I wanna ask you guys something. In what way does this society reflect that example? In what way does our society today allow the LGBTQ community to have their genes passed on to the next generation? Yes, Mohammed. Uh, surrogacy. Surrogacy, that's a good one. Anyone else? Does everybody know what surrogacy means? Surrogacy is when there is a woman and she will house a baby for a couple that can't get pregnant. But usually what happens really is it's like a homosexual couple that wants to have a baby. And one of the males from that homosexual couple will ask the female to take his sperm and impregnate the woman and through artificial insemination. And then she will carry the baby for nine months. And at the end of the nine months, she will give up that baby to that homosexual couple for an exchange of money. Usually, usually quite expensive, but she'll do that. And it's actually a business in America right now. So that's one way. Does anybody else anybody else know any any, any ways that sperm banks? Sperm banks, yes. Anybody else? No? So there's sperm banks, there's surrogacy, there's adoption, right? Because that is also a way that you can through your environment as a homosexual or lesbian couple, you can have your influence on the next generation, right? So this is, this is the way that we are actually allowing the main method of reproduction in the human species of man, male and female to be cheated and allowing them to cheat that male, uh, that, that normal method or natural way of reproduction and allowing them to get their genes passed on to the next generation. So going back to the point in the beginning, if it's natural, it should be scalable to the entire society. But at some degree, the LGBT community must admit that they wanted to remain a rare frequency. They wanted to remain a rare frequency. If it goes beyond that, then it will cause chaos in society like how we have today, where you can be born a man and really you're a woman. You can be 12, but you can identify as 40. All of these things are possible now. So um, I don't know what to say about that, but yeah. Okay, so moving on. We can also give dawah to Muslims. We can also give dawah to Muslims. What are some things that you guys have experienced as far as giving dawah to other Muslims? And this is... This is open. Anybody can respond. What have you experienced? Say you want Muslims to... that don't pray. Muslims that don't pray. Allahu Akbar. Jazakallah khair. He gave the answer to the <laughs> question. <laughs> but anybody else? Think about things that you see from the Ummah that you want to correct or wish to advise. Yeah, brother. 
those people who like uh, don't fast normal, don't feel very small like they have an exam and Allah, non practical Muslims. Non practical Muslims. People yeah. that don't have money and they don't do Hajj. People that have money don't do Hajj, yes. yes. And they want to go to Disneyland. They want to go to Disneyland instead. Allah, 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 Allah. Anything else? Anybody else? Yes, brother. So, generally, like, explain to people who don't know. They want to know something. Yes, yes. So, this is where the da'i comes in. Um, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, call to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the mawridatan hasana. Right? The mawridatan hasana. With a. The hikmat wa mawridatan hasana. With a wisdom and an exor- exhortation that is a good exhortation. With a gentle and, and um, kind exhortation. And be sincere in it. When we are giving advice to the Muslims, or when somebody brings something that isn't from Islam, something that we should always think about is in a dalil, where is the evidence? Where is the evidence for what you are practicing, what you are doing, right? If somebody says to you, brother, Hamza, right? Hamza? No, Adil. Adil, right? If somebody says to you, brother Adil, Allah wants ease for you. He doesn't want hardship for you. So I'm not gonna wear hijab because it's too hard in the society. What would you say? So this is why you're here, right? So what I would say is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also is writing down everything that we're doing. And everything we're doing is a test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Mulk, وَهُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبُلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا that he created death and life to test us to see which of us is best in these, or which of you are best in these, right? So Allah wants ease for us, but he also wants to see how far we will strive in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed something in the Quran, like hijab, like salah, like hajj, like fasting in the month of Ramadan, this is all a way to test us as to see who is best of these. One thing, is for a Muslim to say that they are falling short. They are not doing their best, right? That's one answer that a Muslim can give. Another thing, and this is the this is where it needs to we need to draw a line, is where a Muslim says that this is not Islam. That this is not Islam. That in the West we don't need to do this anymore. That that this that was revealed fourteen hundred and forty five years ago. It doesn't apply to today. This is where we need to draw a line. Is the, is the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu is it good for all time? Yes. And is there anything that we're left to wonder about how we're supposed to act in this daily life? No. Right, so then that's the position that we need to come with when we're talking to these people. If it's hijab, Allah has a wisdom behind hijab for you. Allah has a wisdom behind it for you. It's for your protection. We often say to the sisters that are struggling with hijab that if you had a candy wrapper or a candy that fell on the ground and one candy had a wrapper around it and the other candy didn't have a wrapper on it, which one would you likely eat? The one with the wrapper on it, right? Of course. So this is how we come with hijab. The hijab is your protection. It's what maintains your honor, what maintains your quality. When you take it off, and you expose that to people that are not worthy of such, you're degrading yourself. And it's actually a way for society to now judge you based off of things that aren't, have any value, right? Like how many people have seen billboards that show a woman half naked or whatever, and she's selling something that has nothing to do with the clothes she's wearing, right? So now what they've done is they've taken women and they used her as a marketing tool. And we're the ones oppressing women? When they're being used to sell things, we're oppressing women because women are choosing the hijab themselves to do this. And as you may have heard, Islam is the fastest growing religion amongst women. That women are entering the fold of Islam more than any other, any other gender. So is that because they feel oppressed by Islam? Or is it because it's freeing? 
It's liberating <coughs> to not have to hold to society's standards of beauty, to not have to hold to society's standards of what it means to be beautiful or what it means to be popular or what it means to be this, that, and the other. <coughs> so this is how we come when we're trying to give da'wah to the Muslims. And remember that um, there are some situations where giving advice or da'wah in public is necessary and there are conditions to it. Can anybody give me a reason that they can think of that giving da'wah or correction or advice in public is more necessary than privately? Yes, brother. Because maybe there are other people who are following this industry. Alhamdulillah, barakallah. So this is um, enumerated <coughs> by, I believe it was Ibn Hajar. I'll just read you the quote. As we all know that advice should be given in private when the sins are private. If you see a sin that is done by your Muslim brother in private, then you should hide it so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hide your sins on Qiyamah. That is the, that is the asal. However, uh, Ibn Rajab says that there are situations where it is necessary to give the advice publicly. And he says, if there is a scenario where giving advice openly clearly serves the greater interest, then there is nothing wrong with giving advice openly, such as correcting one who made a mistake in matters of belief in front of people, lest people be deceived by what he said and follow him in his mistake, like the brother mentioned. Another example is denouncing someone who tells people that riba is permissible or spreads bid'ah and immorality among the people. And in such cases, giving advice in public is prescribed and may even be obligatory, meaning wajib. Does everybody understand that? So in today's age with the internet, this is something that is very prevalent. People will post things with women that are not dressed correctly. People will post things with music in the background. And it is not advisable in this kind of a situation to message the person privately and say, hey, music is haram, music, uh, showing women half naked is haram. Especially if people have already seen that and liked it and commented on that reel or post or whatever the case may be. It is upon you to make sure that those people that either liked or saw the video or are viewing the video for the first time see that Oh no, it's actually incorrect in Islam, we don't allow music. No, it's actually incorrect in Islam, we don't show women half naked. That this is against the teachings of Islam. Does that make sense? Yeah. But obviously, everything has its wisdom, and it is upon you to find a way to uh, give the best, um, the best advice in that regard. The last thing I wanted to touch on is, is guidance in our control? No? Who thinks guidance is in our control? Anybody else? And Brother Adil, why do you say that you think guidance is in our, in our control? Um, well, we can choose to guide people. But okay. ultimately, it's the other person's choice whether they want to listen or not, I guess is the right word. Yeah. But uh, we can choose to do that or to not do that. Okay. Okay, so I understand the position you're coming from. In that sense, you can, you have control over your ability to give da'wah. That's what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, You surely cannot guide whoever you like, O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but it is Allah who guides whomever He wills. So at the end of the day, one thing that we all have to understand that it is only upon us to give the message. Hidayah is in the is in the prerogative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our job is to give the message of Al-Islam, convey the basics of Islam, and we leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that person is sincere, searching for the truth, then they will be guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bidna ta'ala. But if they are somebody that's arrogant and were never meant to become Muslim, then you just make dua for them and just make, have sabr as 
we are told in Surah Al-Asr, وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالصَّبْرِ And this is how we can maintain our uh, sanity while giving da'wah. Because oftentimes, you may come across a situation where you gave a lot of effort, but the person just wasn't guided to Islam. It's nothing that you did that was wrong. And you have to realize that all of those things that you did, the effort that you made, that that is all rewards for you on your account on Qiyamah. And you don't know the reward that is waiting for you. So perhaps you will actually lose out on raising your status in Jannah because you were silent on matters that you should have spoken up on. Everybody knows the hadith of um, the one who sees an evil. That does anybody do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. The one who ever sees an evil, then change it with your. And if you cannot, then. Don't. And if you cannot, then. In your heart. And that is the. What was that? No. Nah. So, I don't know about you, brothers, but I don't want to have the lowest level of iman. The least I can do is speak up about something if I have knowledge about it. And all of you, mashallah, tabarakallah, appear to have some knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you about the basics of Islam. It's not hard and it's not something that is with, outside of your reach. All it will take is a little bit of bravery and a little bit of confidence. And I believe in that ta'ala that after today, perhaps you have some tools in your arsenal that will give you the ability to do that. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll take questions and then we'll have a quiz inshallah ta'ala. So any questions? How would you talk to someone who says that I believe there is a creator, but I don't believe in organized religion. Like I, <clears throat> I worship <clears throat> uh, God in my own way. Okay. Yeah, we get this a lot. We get this a lot. So what I always answer with is, if there is a creator that you say that you admit to, right? Would he leave us without any idea of what right and wrong is? Or would he just leave us all confused? That everyone's doing different things and they're going in different directions. And some people say that abortion is right. Some people say abortion is wrong. Some people say that smoking is right. It's okay. Some people say smoking is wrong. Some people say you can drink as much as you want. Someone say only once a week because it's good for you. And some say you shouldn't drink at all. And these are things that affect all of society. Then there's even more pertinent things. Are there two genders? Are there only two genders? You know, should men and women be the only ones that have relationships together? Or should there be more than that? So where do we get our morality from? If you claim that you believe in a creator, I believe that that creator would also reveal to us a morality. Because that's the only thing that makes sense. If he was to leave us with chaos on the world, in the sense that we all follow our own subjective morality, then nobody knows what's true, nobody knows what's false, nobody knows what's good, nobody knows what's bad. And if that's the case, then you can do whatever you want. And the person that says that, I'll ask them, so do you accept with that position that you have no ability to say that this is right or that is wrong? Because if you're saying that there is no morality and that everybody gets to decide, like I just spoke to a Buddhist like maybe two weeks ago, and this is the position he came with, and I, I pressed him on it and I said, so in your position, if, we're, if your morality just comes from yourself, does that mean that for you, a six-year-old man can have relationships with a 10-year-old boy, and that's fine. In your morality, in your philosophy, does that make sense? Because he's, his position was, oh, he's using his mind, which is higher function reasoning, and that's okay then, as long as he's thinking about it. So I said that that doesn't really make sense. Like, if you believe that there's a creator, he would give us guidelines on how to live this life. And... If you believe that he, there's a creator, he will give a way for us to know what that guideline is. And so the Islamic narrative is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Anbiya and they gave us a message and that message was Tawheed and they came with the Sharia. Some of them were Rusul and they came with the Sharia and we follow that Sharia and the Sharia of today is the Sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Quran and the Sunnah. And if there's some anything in the Quran and the Sunnah that you can point out that you disagree with, Whatever it is that some of them say, oh, but the age of Aisha. Okay, well, before the Prophet ﷺ had it legislated the conditions of nikah, 
the Arabs were allowed to marry at any age. It didn't matter what the age was. You were allowed to be married at any age. But after the Sharia came, it, a woman had to be baligha. She had to have been gone through the puberty to allow her to actually engage in the acts of a wife. That's not something that harms a woman. The previous thing harms a woman, where it's any time. So, can we agree that that's better than what was what was before? Yes. Now, what is the age in your belief that is best for a woman to get married? Maybe they'll say 18, maybe they'll say 21, maybe they'll say 16 with the parent's consent. I'll say, well, you disagree with some of the states in the U.S. Some of the states in the U.S. say that 13 with the parent's consent is fine. Some st some states in the U.K. say that it's 14 with the parent's consent is fine. There are English kings that were marrying women at the ages of 12 and 11. The In the Bible, Rebecca was three years old when she married the prophet Isaiah. The Mary, the mother of Isa, السلام, she married Joseph the, uh, I guess you could say, step, stepfather, stepfather. stepfather of Isa salam. He was 90 and she was 13 or 12. Like, where are you coming with your morality from? To judge, to make a value judgment, right? And that's where it says, you have no right to say anything on the matters of morality then. Because what you think is right is just based off of your feelings. You have an icky feeling about it. If I ask somebody else, they might not, and they might actually agree with me. So we need to have something that's uniform and universal for all societies of all time. Is that better? Is that help? I have a question. Yes, really. How do we give dawah to sick people as if we give dawah to them? They also say that we also believe in one God. Mm -hmm. And like, how do we give dawah to sick people? Yeah, so I've had, I've asked... I've asked this question, uh, I've, I spoke to a few Sikhs uh, in my, I guess, career. <laughs> like, um, a lot of the time, they give me different answers as to who they think the gurus are, who they think the Y guru or their god is, right? A lot of the time, they, they have this idea of Wahd al Wajud, that the gurus were once with the god, and then the god sent the gurus, and that actually... The Guru Granth Sahib, which is their book, is actually like God. It's their God themselves. Like it's the God actually, and that's why they bow down to it because it's God's speech. And so we say that that's just you know it's idol worship. Like you guys are making an intermediary to get to God. We believe the Quran is Allah's kalam, but we're not bowing or worshiping or making the Quran on a status more than it deserves. We respect the Qur'an, we, we love it, we memorize it, we live by it, but we don't, you know, take it to extremes. So that's one thing that I would say. And the other thing, and that's one thing that they've admitted to, is that they are similar in Hinduism in that way, where they will take intermediaries to get to God in that way. And they also admit, some of them admit, that the way that they view the gurus themselves is that they do believe that they're divine, like, uh, like part of God originating from God. Wahd al-wujud, some of the Sufiyun say, right? So this is why, when you really push them on it, are they upon Tawheed? No. When you really push them on it, are they upon Shirk? Yes. So that's where I would, if I if I had to, when I, when I do talk to them, I try to highlight the Shirk. Because and plus, we can also say that if Sikhism is truth, then what was the truth before that? Yeah. And they don't have the answer. And that's another thing is that Islam makes a claim and uh, in the deen in Allah Islam that Islam is the only true religion. Now, in the Guru Granth Sahib it says do not think that the one that reads or listens or follows the Bible or the Quran or the Vedas is wrong. It is you for wrong that is saying they are wrong. So if the Quran is right according to your Guru Granth Sahib, why don't you believe it when it says that Quran Islam is the only true religion? And that's one thing that I I wanted, I, I, I asked the Sikhs is, do you believe that you have an exclusivity to the truth? Because I, we believe as Muslims that we have the only truth. We don't believe that anybody else has the truth, but do you believe that Sikhism is the only true religion? Or do you believe that I can benefit from being a Muslim too? And most of the time they, they will say that, no, you can be a Muslim. So I said, so what's the point in, what's the point in me, what's the point in becoming Sikh then? 
if I can be, if I'm still good by, by being a Muslim. Does that make sense? Yes, what? Um, many people uh, say uh, that Allah will since he wrote everything, hmm. everything that will happen. So if he wrote all the bad things that happened, like it was good, so I was supposed to do that bad thing. Hmm. So how should I respond to that? The no, argument I talk about this in the books of uh, Aqidah as well. And they say, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also wrote that he would send messengers. And he's, he also wrote that he was going to send you warners that were going to remind you that this is wrong and this is right. And you as a person living your life like normally, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. You don't know where you're going to end up. So it could be the case that a reminder comes to you and you turn away from your life of sin and you make tawbah and istighfar and you live a life of you know, righteousness. But you don't know. So you may be thinking that this is the father of Allah right now, that I am... A sinful person, a fasik, or whatever you want to call it. But you also could be somebody that is reminded and turns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and becomes a believer. You don't know. The thing about using qadr as an excuse, it's for people that you know just don't want to try. They 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 just want to keep continuing following their desires. They've taken their desires as their Lord, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and that's what um, their concern is really. They just want to continue following their desires. So that's what I would say to the people that say that, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also sent you messengers. And he also sent you um, warners about what is right and what is wrong. Are you confused about what is right and what is wrong? We can have a discussion about that. We can have a discussion about is salah mandatory? Are you allowed to do this? Are you allowed to do that, right? But you can't make the claim that a warner didn't come to you. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the messengers so that we don't have an excuse. But the warning came, right? So that's what I would say. No, <laughs> Okay, yes, yes, yeah. So he, 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 yeah, yes. And that's when his son, right, was swept away and he thought that he could be saved, right? But there was no, no one except those who um, were with Nuh alayhi on that day. And then Nuh alayhi he got upset and he said, you promised me that my, my family was going to be saved, right? But you, you allowed my son to drive and I don't want to be, you know, disobedient. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he was not from your family. And that's something that you guys can take away, is that your family are the ones that follow Islam, the Qur'an and the Sunnah. That, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but I wasn't always Muslim. I accepted Islam 10 years ago. Your family is not who you are necessarily related to. Your family is the ones that believe in the same thing you believe in and act upon what you act upon. Understand? That's really who your family are. When you think about it like that, you realize your family is a lot bigger than what you think it is. Because there's you know, millions of us across the world that really care about Islam and really want to implement it in the best way that we can. So take that as an inshallah. I have a question. Yeah. So, I mean, doing down in, in a formalized setting, uh, just to use the term, yeah. That is, you're going out and you have a table and you have pamphlets. But doing that in uh, non formalized settings, for instance, someone who's in school or at work or when you're with your colleagues or acquaintances, so what is your advice? How should that be approached? Yeah, subhanAllah. So, let me open this and then give out the time. So, I've had this. Um, situation arise a lot because every Friday I leave early and my colleagues are always like, where is he going? Is he getting paid? Like, <laughs> right, so, um, and usually it sparks questions, especially, mashallah, you know, long beard, so like, 
people are going to notice that you you live your life a certain way maybe you don't swear maybe you don't get angry maybe you have manners right so what i say is remember that you are in a professional setting so be mindful of what you do say um especially with the culture that we live in today yeah. that anything can kind of get you fired these days so be careful with the way that you use your words um like when talking about lgbtq stuff i say you know this is what islam says this is the perspective on it um i talk about how uh it is not a sin to necessarily have same-sex attraction it is a sin to act upon that the same way it's a sin to act upon our extramarital affairs so no boyfriend girlfriend things even if they're heterosexual right so i try to tie it back to a a uh, position that conveys the message and the haq but also doesn't leave me susceptible to risk in any such way i think that's the best way, and that's where the hikmah comes in because um you're not hiding the truth you're giving the haq but you're also painting the picture that it's actually not as absurd as you think it is right because we're not the only ones that you know believe that for example homosexuality we're not the only ones that believe that homosexuality is a sin um and there's, there's obviously death prescribed in the bible for homosexuality um so that's something that a lot of people don't know so just highlight these kinds of things where the actual reality of it like i said the, the desires are not necessarily the part where it's a sin it's acting upon it and any acting upon an extramarital relationship that is in men and women in a marriage is not allowed in Islam and then kind of use that kind of thing but if it's something else try and find a way to maintain your safety uh in the workplace um one question i got recently was um uh transgenders like what's Islam say about transgenders so you kind of have to give a full picture right so i say well in Islam when someone is born as a hermaphrodite which is a very small portion of this population in general we tell them to identify which whatever uh, gender is most prevalent in that person and take whatever steps you need in order to uh, eliminate the other right <clears throat> but as far as transgender is concerned with regards to changing from one to the other we believe that is a recipe for um pain and suffering upon the person that's indulging in that and you can highlight the recent you know testimonials of people that have transgender a uh, transition and then they are devastated at what they've done to themselves and wished that somebody didn't believe them so seriously when they were 8 9 10 and forced them to take puberty blockers and listen to use allow them to be agents of their own will when we don't even allow them to be agents of their own will to vote we don't allow them to partake in alcohol we don't allow them to drive but we're allowing them to be such you know agents of their own will at that time it is something that is devastating and what we what we claim is that it's actually you know mutilation of children so it's something that um if you, if you're going to do such a thing perhaps a wait until you are if a mind that is able to process what's happening instead of leaving yourself susceptible to the the um you know the regret the devastating regret which is what we see happening so if if they can be honest and say yeah there is people that regret then what we can say we want to advocate for the safety of children uh completely and we don't want them to be in any sort of disadvantage in life because as you know with puberty blockers it delays their development of any sort of organs as well like the organs that they'll need to function uh whether if they transition or not they'll need those to fully develop in order to transition them into the opposite but if they do that then they're not going to be able to have that occur and it's actually going to be at their detriment at the end of the day. So just kind of highlight these things and find a way to make it so that you are compassionate towards this the situation and highlight the idea that, you know, that uh, 
um, previously in the DSM-5 uh, or DSM-4, gender dysphoria was a you know medically classified mental health issue. And it is only recently that we've unlabeled it as such. And perhaps that was too preemptive. And perhaps it is a spectrum like autism where at some level people are having difficulties with identifying with the gender that they're born in and at the other spectrum end of the spectrum they really want to make that change and they've reached adulthood and they can fully grasp the consequences of the decisions perhaps that's something that you can use as a discussion and talking point because as adults we should be able to have reasonable conversations about these things right so Allahu Akbar. Yes, brother. How do you deal with people that when you say you don't support these LGBTQ, they're like, oh, then you're homophobic or you're uh, anti-homosexual. Yeah. How do you how do you deal with these people? Well, like you said, like I, to say something's a phobia means that I'm afraid. I'm not afraid of any homosexual, lesbian, or <laughs> any of that, right? If you say I'm anti-homosexual, then I can accept that I disagree with that lifestyle. Because, and there are children here, so I don't know if I can speak on this, but what, especially with homosexuality, what they are advocating for, what they are, what they are advocating for is sodomy. They're, ad, they're advocating for uh, the type of intercourse that goes in the wrong uh, ent entryway, exit way, exit way. They're advocating for that. And medic medical science tells us that there are a few issues with that, serious issues with that. There's things like um, that, that that area does not have its own natural lubricant the way that a female's is. There's things like leakage from that area because of it being damaged in such a way that it is no longer able to keep um, its species inside anymore. There's medical problems like STDs and diseases and things that become from that. And this is what they're advocating for. This is what they want us to accept. We simply say again, if it's natural, it should have no detriment to society and no detriment to people. And at the very least, it, it shouldn't harm the person. One time I had a conversation with a um, person from that community, and I highlighted this point, that that area doesn't have any natural lubrication. Don't you feel like that's kind of a sign that it's not meant for that? And he's like, I agree with you that it's not really meant for that, but it, it feels really good. So that's his position, and that's why I said, do we... Do we just do everything that feels good? Like, can anybody that has something that feels good for them act upon that? Anybody? Like even, Yanni, the one that's interested in underage people or um, one that wants to force themselves on people or these kinds of things? Like, we don't allow that. We don't just allow absolute acting upon our desires in society. We have guidelines and rules and morality. So, again, it goes back to where's your morality coming from? What about you say you don't? <laughs> He's okay, he can ask if he wants to ask. If he wants to ask. Did you pass out all the papers? Did you pass out all the papers? Pass out all the papers.